Hi everyone, we're going to talk about some controversies during our nation's early history. And a lot of the co earliest controversies are going to take place around the election of 1796, in which we're going to have John Adams, who is a Federalist, elected to the presidency, and Thomas Jefferson, who is not a Federalist, who is a Democratic Republican, um, who will be elected, or who will become Vice President. At that point in time, whoever got the most number of votes got to be President, whoever got the second highest number of votes got to be Vice President. So that's how you end up with the situation in which you have a President of one party with a very different outlook on the nation and presidential authority, and a Vice President with a, a completely different view set. So, let's keep this in mind because Jefferson and Adams are not going to play nice together uh, while they have to share the executive branch. Well, when John Adams is elected in 1796, he will inherit the same foreign policy nightmares that his predecessor in office, George Washington, had. Most notably, a st very strained relationship between both the United States and Britain and also the United States and France. Um, so, uh, as these two are at war with one another, France is feeling very resentful that the United States did not kind of pay back the favor that it had offered the U.S. in fighting the British. Um, so, for Adams, he's kind of stuck in the same uncomfortable position that Washington was. Um, both the British and the French are essentially harassing U.S. ships on the open oceans, each one trying to gain an advantage over their enemy by halting trade. The United States is trading with both sides, but they're finding British ships, they're finding French ships are stopping uh, these American vessels, boarding them illegally, sometimes stealing the cargo off of those ships, and in some cases stealing sailors off of those ships in a process known as impressment, and then forcing those sailors to work for either the Royal Navy or the French Navy. This problem had accelerated over time uh, to the point where by the time Adams was sworn in as chief executive, more than 300 American ships had been seized and France had broken off diplomatic ties completely with the United States um, because they, they truly felt kind of snubbed and left out in the cold by the United States. So what we're going to see is, is, a, is an undeclared war essentially breaking out between the United States and France as the United States begins to try and kind of um, stand up to uh, French bullying in this case uh, of them seizing our ships and seizing our cargo. I'll let you read a little bit more about the XYZ affair in your book, but a lot of this was considered to be kind of a diplomatic insult when three American diplomats were kind of rebuffed by their French counterparts um, when Adams sent them over to try and smooth things over. Instead, things got worse. You end up with a quasi-war in which the United States will finally begin allocating funds to um, begin its own navy um, and the, the money that they're spending, the time that they're spending in building Building these ships and training the men will pay off. Uh, you'll end up seeing the U.S. Navy seizing French a number of French ships and winning a number of duels on the open ocean. Ultimately, by 1800, the quasi-war comes to an end because France is simply stretched too thin. They're still fighting um, many other powers on the continent, including uh, Great Britain off of the continent, and they just can't be bothered with you know these, these pesky American ships. So essentially the quasi-war, like I said, it was never a formal declaration of war kind of a grudge match, but the United States will ultimately kind of successfully stand up for itself and force the French to agree to neutral shipping. During the war, we'll see a number of acts passed by the Adams administration. Um, Adams, a Federalist, is also working very closely with a Federalist-dominated Congress, so getting these bills passed is, is uh, a relatively easy process for him during this period. The Alien and Sedition Acts, as they are collectively known, will be passed by the Adams administration ostensibly to make the nation safer. So, for example, uh, the Alien Enemies Act now authorizes the president to imprison or deport any alien from an enemy nation. So at this point, for instance, it would be French arrivals uh, that if the president considered them a security risk while the U.S. was at war with France, then he could have them deported and taken off and sent away. Uh, the other acts start to um, 
become very controversial, though, mostly because Thomas Jefferson, an anti-federalist, believes that Adams is using his powers as president, and Congress is, to basically try and strip his opposition, the Democratic-Republican Party, of potential voters. And I say this because, for example, with the Naturalization Act, which will extend the time it takes for recent arrivals to the United States um, to become citizens, will also extend the amount of time it takes for these new arrivals from England or Scotland or uh, Wales, it will also extend the amount of time it takes for them to be able to vote. Because if you're not a citizen, you cannot vote. Well, guess what party many of these new immigrant arrivals tended to vote for? That's right, it's not for the Federalist Party, which was in power at this point in time. It was for the Democratic Republican Party. So Thomas Jefferson and many others are saying, this doesn't make us safer in times of war. Essentially, what you're trying to do is stack the deck, right? You're trying to prevent new arrivals from voting because you know they'll vote your people out of office and vote our people into office. The Sedition Act also, which was the most controversial of the acts, will basically now make it a crime to write, publish, or even say anything that was considered, quote, false, scandalous, or malicious in nature uh, against the President or Congress. Now, again, from Adam's standpoint, it was we need to kind of restrict freedom of speech so that we don't weaken the war effort against France at this point in time. But for Jefferson and others, they said, well, if that is truly the case, then why are the only people being arrested and thrown into prison under the terms of this act? Why are the only ones being targeted? Us, the Democratic Republicans. So, for example, we see that um, under the terms of this legislation, 25 men, most of them editors of Democratic Republican newspapers, who were very critical of the president in the war, they were the ones being convicted and sent to jail. For example, Benjamin Franklin Bach, who was one of Grinch Benjamin Franklin's grandsons, he was the editor of the Philadelphia Democratic Republican Aurora newspaper. He was charged with libeling President Adams in print by calling him, quote, old, bald, black blind, crippled, toothless Adams, unquote. That was the extent of his crime. Um, so, yeah, it, eventually uh, what we're going to see is these acts will be so controversial that all but one of them will be allowed to expire. They will not be renewed by Congress over time. Uh, number one, just so you know, is still in effect the Alien Enemies Act. So what we're going to see is Adams will run for re-election in the year 1800. He will be challenged by Thomas Jefferson. There will be a pretty nasty uh, mudslinging fight between the supporters of Adams and Jefferson. For example, the supporters of Adams called out Thomas Jefferson for carrying on an affair, which was true, uh, with one of his slaves, Sally Hemings, uh, a woman who uh, bore six children of his, four of whom lived to adulthood. So a lot of mudslinging between both sides. Ultimately, what we're going to see, though, you can see the electoral map that year, is that Jefferson will win this contest. And in fact, Adams won't even become vice president. He'll he'll come in third. Aaron Burr, a fellow Democratic Republican, will become the vice president under um, Thomas Jefferson. But Adams wasn't going down without a fight. In the last few hours, literally, of his presidency, he's trying to fill as many judge positions with like-minded Federalists. And one of those judges that was supposed to get his commission right up until Adams rolled out of office in 1803, was a man by the name of William Marbury. He did not, however, get that knock on his door and get the papers to sign. He was promised a position of judge, Justice of the Peace in Washington, D.C. So he will sue um, under the now Jefferson administration. He's going to sue and say, you know, I didn't get my papers in time. I should still be awarded this position. However, the Supreme Court, despite being packed with fellow Federalists, actually did their job job in this case. They looked beyond party affiliation and they looked at the merits of William Marbury's case. And ultimately they will strike down a law uh, that was the basis of William Marbury's case. Um, you don't have to worry about the law itself, but it was the, the Judiciary Act of 1789. They're going to basically invalidate William Marbury's case. They're going to say the law that you based your claim on is unconstitutional. And as the Supreme Court of the United States, as the judiciary branch, we get to determine what is constitutional or unconstitutional. So this will be the first time we'll see the concept of judicial review introduced, the Supreme Court deciding what is lawful and what is not lawful and striking it down.
So Thomas Jefferson will be the new commander-in-chief. Uh, he will be very insistent that under his term in office, he would repeal taxes, he would slash government expenses, he would cut military expenditures, he would pay off the public debt, that he was going to scale back the role of the federal government and allow the states to have a little more authority. We'll see that in some cases he will abide by his own rhetoric. In other cases, he will be pretty hypocritical. Uh, probably the, the most glaring example of Jefferson Jefferson kind of going back on his own campaign promises was the acquisition of the Louisiana Territory from France, which um, uh, uh, he will manage to send James Monroe to Paris uh, to um, basically purchase this huge tract of territory that was under French control. By 1803, Napoleon Bonaparte, the leader of France, was in dire straits financially, so he was receptive to hearing what these American diplomats had to say. Uh, he ultimately agreed to sell this territory to the United States. And you can see from the map here, it will effectively double the size of this still young nation overnight with the stroke of a pen. But in order to begin settling this area, you need to know what you might be buying. The Lewis and Clark expedition was actually put together before the Louisiana Purchase was completed. Uh, this was Jefferson and Congress's idea to send some, uh, several explorers uh, westward to kind of see maybe where the country would be moving in future. So the Lewis and Clark expedition will be sent out to try to find a water route across the continent. They, they had believed, as did the Spanish, as did the French incorrectly, that there was reported a huge waterway known as the Northwest Passage uh, stem, uh, moving that would move water all the way from the Mississippi River to the West Coast, the Pacific Coast. That did not exist, obviously. There are plenty of, uh, of uh, rivers out west, but none of them directly connecting with one another all the way to the west coast. So this Northwest Passage, this is the main reason why Lewis and Clark were being sent out, and they never discover it. But along the way, they do discover some pretty fascinating things. And they will, of the 50 men who originally left on this two-year expedition, 49 of those 50 men will return back home safe and sound. They will only lose one member of their expedition to appendicitis, which would have required surgery, something that probably would have resulted in that person dying anyway, even if they were in Philadelphia or Charleston. Uh, so, yeah, pretty successful expedition. Uh, they were able to come back with all kinds of new information on the flora and the fauna of this region region, as well as the Native American tribes, most of whom welcomed them uh, graciously, uh, if for no other reason than they had a Native American woman, Sacagawea, who was joining them on this trip, and she helped as a translator and helped uh, them navigate and learn about the various plants and animals uh, that were uh, available in the region. So what we're going to see, though, is despite uh, the fact that Lewis and Clark did not get killed by many of these Native American tribes, the, the vision that the country has, Jefferson and many included, is, is that these peoples needed to be assimilated into the United States, that ultimately they needed to sort of abandon their traditional ways of life, settle down in one place, as you can see from Jefferson's speech before Congress here, adopt, you know, Western styles of dress, learn to speak English, learn to embrace Christianity, that this was the view of most Americans during this time period, that Native American culture should not be respected on, uh, you know, on its, on its own merits, but instead should really be subsumed to American culture, and that these people should just be assimilated and uh, try to become more like American citizens over time. And this is the view that will really carry forward uh, much of U.S. policy towards Native American peoples for the next century after this, really. And we're going to see a little bit more controversy with the Jefferson administration. His vice president, Aaron Burr, he and Alexander Hamilton, a Federalist, had had been kind of engaged in a low-level war of words for years. Uh, this will break out into actually open conflict as uh, Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton will duel in 1804, and uh, Burr will end up killing Hamilton, which was uh, obviously against the law during this time period. <laughs>